Hello again, my name is Nate. I have the website called M Catalyst, where I am posting a whole bunch of free resources, notes and tips about the MCAT, things of that sort. I also offer tutoring. You can find all of that in the link in the description. If you are here at this video, that means you are wanting to watch the shorter, isolated Krebs cycle video. This video will also be included in a longer, full-length metabolism video where I cover everything start to finish. We will just be covering the Krebs cycle in this video just to make things a little bit shorter and easier for you to access. I've also made some notes uh, on these slides that you can use for whatever you want, just to make it so all you have to do is sit back and listen. You don't actually have to be actively writing notes. I have everything written down on those notes. You can also find that in the description as well, as well as links to my other videos and resources, of course. Where we just left off with the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, I wanna remind you that we are inside of the mitochondrial matrix right now. We have just produced acetyl CoA. We're producing two acetyl CoA for every glucose, because remember, glucose is a six carbon sugar. It's going to produce two three carbon pyruvates, and those two pyruvates will both go through the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So we're gonna end up with two acetyl CoA, and they are both going to be going through the Krebs cycle, the next step. I did also want to make sure to add in to our roadmap here, the little sidetrack that anaerobic respiration takes off of pyruvate. If you're confused about what anaerobic respiration is, just make sure you go back and watch my PDC and fermentation video. So the Krebs cycle, it's also called the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. They're all interchangeable. Like I mentioned earlier, it is going to be taking place in the mitochondrial matrix of most cells. Kind of like we talked about with the PDC, red blood cells do not have mitochondria, so they are not going to be doing the Krebs cycle. And because it's taking place in the mitochondrial matrix, it is also going to be aerobic, meaning that the Krebs cycle requires the presence of oxygen. The goal or net reaction of what we have happening in the Krebs cycle. So we're basically adding one acetyl CoA to this looping reaction and adding that acetyl CoA to the loop is going to cause us to create three NADH, one FADH2, one GTP, an oxaloacetate that's basically the ending product of the Krebs cycle, and two carbon dioxides. We're going to be losing more carbon dioxides in this process. One thing that I want to note really quickly is that GTP is interchangeable with ATP. So I'm from here on out, I'm go just going to start using ATP. Just know that technically in the actual reaction that we'll talk about later, we're technically making GTP, but that's interchangeable with ATP for the purposes of the MCAT. Just to basically explain with words what's going on, we're taking this two carbon acetyl CoA, we're going to combine it with a four carbon oxaloacetate, the thing that's at the end of the cycle, this is going to form a six carbon molecule called citrate. This is basically where the start of the Krebs cycle is. Citrate is going to undergo a series of oxidations and decarboxylations, a few other reactions, and this is going to allow us to produce more ATP and electron carriers. So far, like we've done with glucose and pyruvate, we're basically just trying to suck as much energy out of this carbon chain that we can in order to either produce ATP directly or electron carriers, which will go on to produce ATP at the electron transport chain. Again, just as a reminder, this entire cycle is going to happen twice per glucose since each glucose is going to produce two pyruvate and those two pyruvate will become two acetyl CoA. So per glucose, we can basically just double all of these numbers. We're going to be using two acetyl CoA. That's going to produce six NADH in this cycle, two FADH2, two ATP, which like I said, is interchangeable with GTP for our purposes, two oxaloacetate and four carbon dioxides. We are going to be doing the Krebs cycle when we are in that fed postprandial state, but additionally in aerobic conditions when we need ATP. Like we mentioned with the PDC, we cannot use mitochondrial processes when oxygen is not present, so therefore we need aerobic conditions in order to actually run the Krebs cycle. Technically, the Krebs cycle is always going to be on, but for the purposes of the MCAT, it is mainly prioritized in the postprandial condition. Do want to also jump in and just state that I fixed a typo later on the slide. You didn't miss anything, just if you noticed that the slide kind of shifted around, that's why. 
The enzymes that you need to know are the four dehydrogenases. If you look over at the Krebs cycle figure that I made on the right, you'll notice that there's four dehydrogenases. We're going to go over all of these on the next slide, but there's four different dehydrogenases in the Krebs cycle. They're going to be catalyzing redox reactions just as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex did. Notice that dehydrogenase is a pretty good indicator that we're going to be doing a redox reaction, which means we're probably going to be producing electron carriers in those steps. We'll talk about that here in a second. You also need to know succinyl COA synthetase and fumarase. We'll talk about why you need to know those enzymes on the next slide. But you also don't have to necessarily worry about some of the other enzymes that aren't listed, especially at the top of the cycle, like a conotase, for example. You don't really need to know too much about those for the purposes of the MCAT. The hormone that will promote the Krebs cycle, like I mentioned, mainly we're talking about the postprandial state here. The Krebs cycle is largely going to be on most of the time, but specifically here, when we're talking about the postprandial state, is of course going to be promoted by insulin. Insulin is going to promote glycolysis. That is going to increase how much pyruvate we have. We're going to bring that pyruvate into the mitochondria, and the PDC will turn that into acetyl CoA. So just because insulin promotes all of these before processes, it's going to increase the reaction actant of the Krebs cycle, acetyl-CoA, therefore promoting it. The specific conditions that are going to be promoting the Krebs cycle, like we just talked about, insulin has a way of directly promoting the Krebs cycle through that chain reaction, through glycolysis and the PDC. But of course, if we do not have a lot of ATP, we're going to turn on the Krebs cycle quite a bit more so we can produce a lot more ATP and electron carriers. Also having high glucose or acetyl-CoA, of course, is going to help push us through the Krebs cycle. And then the last thing that I wanted to add is that having a low amount of electron carriers will also cause us to turn on the Krebs cycle as well. We are producing a ton of electron carriers in the Krebs cycle, way more than any other process that we've talked about so far. Glycolysis only produced two, the PDC also produced two. We're producing eight in the Krebs cycle per glucose. So that's just why I wanted to mention that having low amounts of electron carriers is also something that's going to be promoting the Krebs cycle. Just like our other processes, if we have a bunch of ATP or we have a bunch of electron carriers, we of course don't need to be running the Krebs cycle anymore. Therefore, those are the conditions that will inhibit it, having a high amount of ATP or high electron carriers. The one thing that I want to mention really quickly that you might be noticing, especially if you've watched my other videos, is that glucagon has often been the antithesis to insulin. If a process was promoted by insulin, it was inhibited by glucagon. Like I mentioned earlier, the Krebs cycle is pretty much always going to be on unless we're in anaerobic conditions. So like we're talking about right now with the postprandial state, where we are well fed, we have a, a ton of glucose going through our body, of course we're going to need to run the Krebs cycle because it's logically the next step. But as another example, beta oxidation, fatty acid breakdown, whatever you want to call it, occurs in long-term fasting when we've been fasting for roughly a day. And so what we do is we're going to break down that fat and that fat is broken down into acetyl-CoA and we're going to use acetyl-CoA as the main energy source from there. Beta oxidation or fatty acid breakdown is promoted by glucagon. And since that process is producing more acetyl CoA, we actually have a sort of way that glucagon can actually promote the Krebs cycle. This gets a little bit beyond the scope of the MCAT. So I don't want you to worry about it. That's why I've pretty much just left it completely off the slide. But I did want to just make that note just in case you were curious. This will all make a lot more sense whenever we actually talk about metabolism in general. I highly recommend watching my metabolism hormone video to make more sense of what's going on with insulin and glucagon. So now to actually talk about the Krebs cycle enzymes and intermediates, specifically what you need to know about each. We're first going to talk about with the intermediates themselves. You need to know the names of the intermediates. There's going to be a mnemonic that's really going to help us with this. It's listed there at the bottom. Can I keep selling sardines for money officer? The one that I knew was a little bit less appropriate for that. Not really appropriate for YouTube, but whatever works, that's totally fine. And you also are going to want to know the number of carbons of each intermediate. You'll sometimes see some advice that you need to memorize the structures of the intermediates throughout metabolism, especially the Krebs cycle. You can actually answer pretty much every single one of those questions that I've ever seen just with the knowledge of how many carbons each of these molecules will have. 
For example, you may have a question basically asking which of the following substrates is not involved in the Krebs cycle. And then maybe you'll have two answer choices that have six carbons in it, one that has four, and then one that has three carbons in it. You'll notice that in this entire cycle, there is no substrate that has three carbons in it. So that would be your answer. Long story short, highly recommend knowing the names of each intermediate a mnemonic will really help. And then the number of carbons of each intermediate. And that should help with pretty much every single question you'll see in that regard. As far as the enzymes of what you need to know, I'm going to make a note about how they're named first. I want you to note as we're going through these enzymes that they are named for the substrate or the reactant that they are turning into something else. So they're going to have some sort of naming about the substrate and then the rest of the name will be what type of enzyme it is. Just as an example, as we're looking at the four dehydrogenases, a dehydrogenase in metabolism is going to be an enzyme that will catalyze one of our redox reactions. And our redox reactions, like we've been talking about in our other videos, we are oxidizing our carbon chain in order to reduce NAD into NADH or reduce FAD into FADH2. This is the first time that we're actually going to see FADH2 so far in aerobic respiration, but just know that the dehydrogenases are going to be catalyzing these redox reactions. For example, the first enzyme that we're going to look at is isocitrate dehydrogenase. Basically, this is an enzyme that will be oxidizing isocitrate into a molecule called alpha ketoglutarate, which will help us form the reduced NADH. It will help us form an electron carrier. It's also going to kick off a carbon dioxide. This is called a decarboxylation reaction. It's basically part of the process that's going to help us provide the energy for the production of an electron carrier and ATP. But basically, long story short, isocitrate dehydrogenase, what that name is telling me is that it is taking isocitrate and it is running a redox reaction with it. More specifically, it is oxidizing and decarboxylating isocitrate into a five carbon alpha ketoglutarate it is also going to be forming one carbon dioxide and one NADH. So notice that this is the first enzyme that you really need to know about. Technically, we are starting the Krebs cycle with acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate. We're gonna put those two together to form citrate, which is why it's called the citric acid cycle. But you don't really need to worry about those enzymes. The important enzymes that the MCAT cares about are the ones that are producing our electron carriers or ATP. There's a few other enzymes that don't necessarily directly do that that we're gonna talk about, but we'll get to those later. So isocitrate dehydrogenase is the first enzyme in the cycle that you need to know about. The next enzyme comes immediately after it, and it's basically going to be doing the exact same thing, just with alpha ketoglutarate instead of isocitrate. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is going to be oxidizing and decarboxylating alpha ketoglutarate into a molecule called succinyl COA, which is only a four carbon molecule now at this point, and in doing so will help us produce one NADH as well as releasing that second carbon dioxide. This is the last decarboxylation reaction that we're gonna have. There's only two in the Krebs cycle and it's in the first two enzymes that you need to know. The next enzyme that we're gonna talk about is succinyl COA synthetase. This is an enzyme that is going to be taking succinyl COA. We're going to lose that coenzyme A side group and that's going to release energy that we can give directly to the production of ATP. This will leave us with succinate, a four carbon molecule that is going to go through another dehydrogenase reaction to produce fumarate. Succinate dehydrogenase will be oxidizing succinate into fumarate, therefore allowing us to reduce FAD plus into FADH2. This is the only step that is going to produce FADH2. Additionally, this is going to come up whenever we talk about the electron transport chain, but succinate dehydrogenase, interestingly, is also basically directly part of complex two of the electron transport chain. We'll explain why that's important whenever we get there, but just for now, I want you to know that succinate dehydrogenase, we've obviously talked about its responsibility in the Krebs cycle, but it's also part of the ETC as well, and we'll explain why whenever we get there. The next enzyme in the cycle that you need to know is fumarase. Notice in the name, we, we are taking this fumarate. We're basically inserting water into the molecule in kind of a complex way, don't worry about it, forming malate. These are both four carbon molecules. Pretty much the only thing I recommend knowing is that the formation of malate requires water as a reactant. 
and that reaction is catalyzed by fumarase. One thing that helped me memorize that the formation of malate was the special one, notice that malate is the only substrate in the Krebs cycle that starts with an M. If you turn that M upside down, it's a W, which you can take to stand for water. So the formation of malate, the only substrate that starts with an M, turn it upside down, you get a W. Formation of malate requires water. Just kind of a dumb way that I memorize the fumarase step. Once we have produced this four carbon malate, we're gonna be able to run it through our last dehydrogenase, malate dehydrogenase. This is going to be oxidizing malate into our last substrate, oxaloacetate, OAA for short, still a four carbon molecule. And in doing so is going to allow us to reduce NAD plus into NADH. So as you can see, per acetyl-CoA, through the Krebs cycle, we are forming three NADH, one FADH2, two carbon dioxides, and one ATP. So per glucose, since every glucose is going to form two acetyl-CoA, in total, the Krebs cycle will produce six NADH, two FADH2, four carbon dioxide, and two ATP. So just one last thing that I wanted to reiterate on this slide. If you just memorize the names of the intermediates, mnemonics are really going to help you with that. Knowing the names of the enzymes is very easy because they are very predictable in how they are named. It's a dehydrogenase. It's going to be forming an electron carrier of some sort. They are also all named after their substrates as well. So it should be pretty easy to just line them up in order if you know the intermediates as well as how many carbons they each have. Now to talk about regulating the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle and its enzymes are promoted, like we mentioned earlier, we do have a, a sort of indirect way that insulin will promote the Krebs cycle. It's gonna increase glycolysis, that's gonna drive forward the PDC, therefore we have more acetyl-CoA to run the Krebs cycle with. It's also going to be promoted when we have high glucose and acetyl-CoA. Again, that should intuitively make sense by now. And of course, if we have low amounts of energy, we want to be running the Krebs cycle more. If we have low amounts of ATP, we're gonna run the Krebs cycle a bunch to produce more ATP. Conversely, the Krebs cycle and its enzymes are going to be inhibited by, of course, negative feedback loops where a reaction's own products will inhibit that reaction. For example, for the reaction catalyzed by succinate dehydrogenase, if we increase the amount of fumarate or FADH2 of the cell and mitochondria, that is going to inhibit succinate dehydrogenase, creating sort of like a roadblock in the middle of the Krebs cycle. And then of course, if we have high amounts of ATP, we don't have any reason to do the Krebs cycle anymore, that will also inhibit it as well. Just as a real quick summary of the Krebs cycle, this is the last slide. It's going to take place in the mitochondrial matrix, except for red blood cells because they don't have mitochondria, so they are not gonna be doing the Krebs cycle. Therefore, because it is in the mitochondrial matrix, it's aerobic. This is occurring in the exact same place as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So both of these reactions are going to be considered aerobic, meaning they require the presence of oxygen. We're gonna be taking one acetyl-CoA, combining it with the four carbon oxaloacetate. This is going to allow us to run citrate through a whole bunch of reactions to produce three NADH, one FADH2, one GTP slash ATP since they're interchangeable, one oxaloacetate and two carbon dioxide. All of that is per acetyl-CoA. So if we want to look at how much is produced per glucose, that is going to double everything in this reaction. 2-acetyl-CoA will help us produce 6-NADH, 2-FADH2, 2-ATP slash GTP, 2-oxaloacetate, and of course, 4-carbon dioxide. We are largely going to be doing this in fed aerobic conditions when we need a lot of ATP. Like I said earlier, we're also going to be doing the Krebs cycle in a few other times that aren't necessarily postprandial, but for the MCAT, you need to know that postprandial conditions, we're going to be doing a lot of the Krebs cycle. You need to know the four dehydrogenases because they're going to be doing those redox reactions that catalyze our production of electron carriers in the Krebs cycle. You also need to know succinyl CoA synthetase since that's the step that's directly producing ATP. And you also need to know fumarase since that's the unique one that involves water. Whenever we form malate, which starts with an M, turn that M upside down, you get water. You need to know that the hormone that has that indirect way of promoting the Krebs cycle is insulin since it's just going to be increasing the amount of acetyl-CoA in the cell. The conditions that will be promoting the Krebs cycle, of course, the release of insulin like we talked about earlier. And then of course, if we have low amounts of ATP or electron carriers, that's also gonna promote the Krebs cycle. And then of course, if we have high amounts of glucose or acetyl-CoA, that will promote the Krebs cycle. 
Conversely, it will be inhibited by high amounts of ATP and high amounts of electron carriers. If we've got plenty of energy or energy producers, we don't need to worry about making anymore. So that's the Krebs cycle. It follows the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex in aerobic respiration, and it will lead to the electron transport chain, our next video.